Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Okay, so Trevor, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, pleased to be here to give this presentation, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, high performance flat plate voided slabs. We're going to talk about a system. I want you to know this is not a proprietary system. I'm not going to mention the, even the name of my company. It was done by uh, Trevor, and that's the extent of it. Uh, but I look forward to uh, many questions, perhaps after the presentation. So this uh, presentation came out of an article that we wrote, uh, was published in CI uh, last January, uh, the year before, uh, really talking about a combination of emerging technologies. Some of them truly emerging, some of them have been around. Uh, for example, the voided slabs have been around for about 15 years in its modern uh, uh, concept, if you will. But then leveraging uh, higher strength concretes, uh, uh, high strength rebar, grade 8615, and the combination with post-tensioning, uh, banded, banded post-tensioning, so banded in both directions to really optimize the system. And so we'll talk about that, some projects where this has been leveraged, and a couple other things, given the time, I'm not going to dwell too much on any particular thing, but we'd like to think that uh, ancient builders found um, inspiration in nature to, to come up with these kinds of, kinds of structures. We certainly see that in the, in the roof of the Pantheon in Rome. Uh, obviously, the goal here is to reduce weight. Uh, fast forward 2,000 years, we're all familiar with the waffle system. It's a form of avoided, uh, flat, uh, avoided slab. And uh, the, the innovation nowadays is this uh, that you see on the screen. So these are recycled plastic voids that go inside uh, cages, wire cages. The, this technology was developed in, uh, in Germany about 20 years ago, brought to the US. We, we've had uh, about 20 projects now. Um, but essentially, the goal here is to reduce the dead load and be able to span further. And couple that with post-tensioning, we can get to the 15 to 20 meter spans that we're really looking for. That's really the goal, uh, to be able to, to achieve those kinds of spans. The goal is to build without beams. I I'm not gonna read the, the list, but obviously in a, in a tall building, we can optimize the, 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 the structure by adding potentially two floors, or conversely, reduce the, the height of the building and, and uh, reduce the cost associated with um, uh, vertical cladding, for example, the skin of the building, expensive uh, vertical uh, elevators and things like that. We're really looking at what's called the triple bottom line, be able to provide a structure that's flexible uh, for the occupants, uh, a structure that's economical and it's sustainable by being resource efficient. We are reducing the amount of material that goes in the structure by reducing the dead load in the, in, in the floors where the, most of the mass is concentrated. So by doing that, we're able to be more resource efficient and uh, we believe provide a, a sustainable structure. That results, for example, and, and these are on average numbers, about 40% fewer columns, 20% less carbon in the environment, 35% less weight impact uh, on costs. Uh, one metric that we have been using that we believe is uh, an important consideration here that um, talks about the reduction of CO2 emissions is uh, 425 pounds per cubic yard of concrete uh, is related to CO2 emissions. So by reducing uh, sometimes several hundred yards of uh, concrete, we are reducing the CO2 emissions. Uh, so how do we look at this? Uh, very uh, qualitatively here, I'll just load this up. Obviously, we want to build without beams. So the most efficient way of doing this is by looking at this particular system. I mean, we can compare the, the solid to avoided slab, the same span, uh, solid to avoided slab, same dead weight. Uh, and there are some efficiencies, as you'll see here, but it's really by re removing beams. Beams are expensive to form. Uh, by removing the beams, we can um, then come up with a structure that's got less uh, thickness and, and be more efficient. We're actually working with COM on some uh, projects where uh, we can provide the same uh, ceiling height, but reduce as much as potentially a foot per floor uh, on uh, you know, a 15 meter span uh, here. Uh, from a design principle, it's very straightforward to design. This is just a conventional uh, waffle slab, if you will. The big item is shear. So we're gonna talk about, uh, obviously the focus of this uh, session here is to talk about punching shear, but uh, a little bit on the dead load stiffness, uh, but focusing on shear. Um, Go, uh, as we go. So um, slab dead load reduction, about 30%, depending on the extent of the void coverage in the slab. Typically, we do about 65 to 70% coverage. The rest of the slab is solid around the columns for punching shear purposes. We are reducing slab stiffness for about, by about 10%. Uh, 
Here we're removing the concrete in the middle third of the slab, really in the region of the slab where it, the concrete's not doing much to carry the work uh, of the slab. So uh, by reducing, uh, by, by concentrating the, the, the mass on top and the bottom, we uh, impact the stiffness a little bit. That's uh, obviously offset by the dead load reduction uh, to a certain extent. This is the big item. Uh, slab shear resistance can vary between 40 to 60 percent as compared to a solid slab. And you see, you know, this is a, a big range. Well, it depends on the size of the voids. Smaller voids will have more concrete. The larger voids will result in less concrete. So, uh, and this, by the way, is typical of all the suppliers. So what you're going to see here today um, is common to all the suppliers. So let me share this with you. From a graphical standpoint, what are we talking about here? So if you, took, if you look at a avoided slab, um, and uh, we're going to look at, you know, as, as the, the cracks propagate from flexure all the way to the support and become shear cracks, they can be inclined as much as uh, 30 degrees, but let's look at a critical case of 45 associated with diagonal tension. And so from that standpoint, if we run three planes, you see plane one here, plane two, and plane three, these planes uh, cut the section, as you'll see here, and this is the worst case scenario where you have the least amount of concrete left to carry shear. So this is about 65%. Just to be on the conservative side, we'd like to start at about 50%. So wherever there's voids, wherever the shear demand, if you will, exceeds 50% of the capacity of the slab with voids, then um, the slab has to be solid. Beyond that point, the slab can be voided. So, this is just a simple graphical representation of what's going on. Uh, uh, several studies were conducted in Germany at Kaiserslautern University uh, where they ex did uh, full-scale experiments. And you'll see here they uh, obviously developed uh, uh, FE models, calibrated with the experiments. Uh, but so you saw in the beginning that these voids are placed in wire cages. The slab without the cages performed at about 50% shear capacity. That's that magic number, 50%. But if you actually were to include the contribution of the cages, which we don't because we don't consider them structural, they're just a positioning to hold the voids in place, you could get very close to 100% shear capacity. But so it's there, uh, it's steel, it doesn't know that uh, it's not contributing, obviously, uh, but it contributes. Uh, but we, we ignore it because we don't want to codify it. Uh, Two-way shear tests were done, uh, again, uh, in, in Germany, and you, you will see uh, where the voids were placed with reinforcement, top and bottom uh, uh, reinforcement layers. Uh, load applied uh, at these points and the supports here. And the slab cracked about here. Uh, so I'll just go back to the previous slab. So that's about here where the voids are. So uh, how do we take this information to practice? None of these, you're not going to find any of this, by the way, in ACI 318. Uh, so uh, we have the experimental tests. We have papers that have been written. Um, hopefully you can see this in the back, but these are actual details from projects where the uh, voids have been used. And so what we've done is uh, take uh, at the critical section, in this particular case the engineer uh, put in a draw panel, but take the critical case and go two times the slab thickness beyond that point before we start the voids. Kind of leveraging St. Bernard's principle, if you will, to be far enough away from the critical section to dissipate uh, the, the, uh, the, the stresses before we place the voids. If there's no drops, again, if this is the critical section uh, around the column, we would place the voids uh, at two times the slab thickness. Likewise, at an edge, um, we would place the voids over two, two times the slab thickness away from, from, from the edge. That's the practice that has been uh, done by several engineering firms in the US. And this is also important because in uh, 318, uh, section 18, requires that at the critical section, the slab be able to carry the gravity loads as it's being translated through an earthquake. So that, that, th this is more so to, to ensure that uh, you can carry the gravity, load, the, the gravity loads at this point uh, during an, an earthquake. So again, you're not going to find this in ACI 318. It's a recommendation that engineers have uh, subscribed to. So, um, so far, everything uh, is working out OK. Uh, some other tests done in, in uh, Germany looked at flexure. And you see here a voided slab in yellow, uh, a solid slab in white. And you can see here that they performed uh, equally well. From a seismic standpoint, uh, you can design this as a, as a diaphragm to take lateral forces to collectors and cords. Uh, you'd have to make some of these uh, cords and, and collectors uh, solid in the slab. 
uh, to transfer the forces, but otherwise uh, the design is uh, uh, no different than a conventional diaphragm. Uh, very quickly, something on fire rating. The question has come up, well, how do these uh, slabs perform in a fire? Uh, I know it has nothing to do with, with shear here, but I thought it was interesting to share with, with you folks. We're actually been given, based on tests that were conducted on a full-scale specimen, uh, an eight-inch slab with four-inch voids, uh, three-quarter inch nominal cover, and number four bar top and bottom each way, 12 inches on center, lasted about close to three hours uh, in, in a furnace based on ASTM U1, uh, oh, now, now it's escaping me. Um, the fire rate, the fire test. Uh, so up to two hours in, in the IBC, uh, and that usually covers most of the, um, the applications. Uh, very quickly, if I'm still okay with time, a few more minutes. Uh, just some uh, reference projects where this has been used. Um, some projects are under construction, some have been completed. I'm gonna focus on this one. You saw uh, the, the initial uh, slide had the picture of this building. This is the uh, Columbia University Medical Center in New York City. Uh, so I'll show you some photographs of that and um, you know why the, they decided to use this system. So um, uh, 15 stories, 100, about 100,000 uh, uh, square feet, uh, 10,000 uh, square meters roughly. Uh, so here we're looking at post-tensioning banded banded um, and this was design, designed about 10 years ago. As I'm aware, folks, this is the first job in the U.S. where banded banded concept was used. Traditionally, we do banded and then uniform in a perpendicular du direction. But in this case, the engineer do, did a banded band, and then you can, you can also see that these are bonded tendons, unlike typical building construction where the tendons are unbonded. But they wanted to go with bonded tendons. Um, and, but here, the void's in the middle. Uh, so you'll see here some of the the uh, pictures of the frame, uh, maybe some better pictures here. Uh, well, you, you see some large cantilevers um, that, and, and sloping, sloping slabs, which really made this interesting. Uh, imagine placing concrete with voids that want to float because you're displacing a lot of volume <laughs> on a sloping slab. Uh, so they actually had to, uh, if you're wondering how this was done, it, this is done in, in a couple of ways, but in this particular case, the contractor had to strap the whole system down to the formwork. It wasn't just enough to, to strap it down to, to, to the rebar because there's not enough mass to hold the uplift, the buoyancy force, but they strapped it down to the formwork uh, and they were able to place the concrete without uh, any issues. Just some more pictures. Uh, you're kind of showing the lateral force resisting system of the building, uh, but very few columns, uh, some nice cantilevers here, sloping columns. And so uh, this is a rendering of uh, 3D of the frame. And so I'll leave you with this last uh, slide. Um, the future is here, folks. This project is under construction right now in uh, Southern California. I'm not allowed to tell you where the project is. We're under strict uh, orders from the owner. We can't say what the name of the project. Let me uh, just show a couple things. You'll see here uh, banded, banded post-tensioning and voids in the middle. This is, uh, I, I, so these spans are in the 15 to 20 meter uh, range, at, at least in a long direction. In the short direction, they're about 10 meters or so. Uh, but this is exciting because this, we believe, combines all the, the technologies that we're talking about here to really create an efficient system. Um, so um, this project is so exciting, it might as well be from another galaxy, and I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you.